the Southern Poverty Law Center is also at the center of uh, this white supremacist history. Mark, talk about who Frazier is. Well, I would say he was uh, one of the best uh, known white supremacist activists in the country uh, for a very long time. Uh, he's been active for more than 40 years in the movement. He joined as a very young teenager, joined uh, things like the National States Rights Party, uh, uh, a descendant of the American Nazi Party, and some other groups as well. So uh, he was an important player, uh, but as you mentioned, he uh, testified in the sedition trial in 1988 in Fort Smith, Arkansas, against most of his comrades, some 13 leaders uh, of the white supremacist movement. That very much put him, uh, of course, on the outs. He was seen as a snitch, uh, derided very widely. Uh, he's been banned right up to this day on certain uh, racist web forums. So there are, I think, mixed feelings in the movement about him. Uh, he has, in some ways, worked his way uh, back into the good graces of his uh, former fellows in the sense that he's written an autobiography describing himself as an aggrieved white man. This was back in 2002. Uh, since 2005, he's been publishing a newspaper called The Aryan Alternative. So there are mixed feelings about him out there on the scene. Uh, it is even conceivable that Miller uh, engaged in this mass murder, if, if in fact he is proven to have done so, uh, as a way of showing that he really wasn't a snitch. He was really in it for real. I want to play part of an interview with Heidi Byrick, head of the Southern Poverty Law Center's Intelligence Project, that she did with Fraser Glenn Miller um, just uh, months ago, in the fall of 2013. Whites are in fact dying out. Uh, uh, Jews are increasing. <laughs> God, Glenn, you and your crazy numbers, you know, whites are not Well, dying. it is all a matter of goddamn simple or of arithmetic you refuse to recognize. No, for you, it's a, it's a matter of really uh, stupid, simple argumentation. I wouldn't even be in the movement if not for that. Well, we went, you we went you from 90 percent, when I was 25 years old, you United States were 90 percent white. Yeah, that doesn't mean whites are being exterminated. There's just other people here. Everything that's killing us was brought about by Jews. Killing the, us? Legal, killing legalization, us. the legalization of abortion that has already killed, what, 40 million white babies oh, in the United God. States. That's Frazier Glenn Miller. He went on to praise Joseph Paul Franklin, a serial killer who was executed last year for the sniper killing of a man outside a synagogue in 1997. He killed a number of other people, including an interracial couple and two black teenage boys, and firebombed a synagogue. And he famously tried to kill Hustler magazine publisher Larry Flint and civil rights activist Vernon Jordan Jr. This is what Frazier Glenn Miller said about Franklin just months ago. You know, they're going to kill him November 20th. Uh, yeah, what he did was pretty, pretty heinous, you have to admit. He was gunning people down. Well, he did have a rationale for it. <laughs> a rationale? I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't unreasonable. Yeah. It, was, it wasn't uh, unreasonable in his mind. He thought he was doing the right yeah, thing. Yeah, but that's what all murderers have, some kind of rationale. He's a vigilante. A righteous vigilante is what I would call uh, him. That's Fraser Glenn Miller uh, just months ago uh, talking about Joseph Paul Franklin, who was executed last year for the killing spree that he went on. Um, Mark Potok, uh, also the center, um, your, your center, the Southern Poverty Law Center, talk about uh, the plot against the founder, Morris Dees. Well, uh, Miller saw Morris uh, as his mortal enemy. At that point, uh, Morris and the center were becoming uh, well-known. We were just starting our first uh, major lawsuits against Klan groups. The first one was against the United Klans of America, uh, based here in uh, Alabama. And so, uh, you know, this idea was going around that Morris Dees was the absolutely number one enemy of white supremacy in America, and he needed to be taken out. Uh, Miller, in fact, created a, a point system, quote unquote, uh, where uh, people like Joseph Paul Franklin would get one point for killing black people, 10 points for killing Jews, 50 points for killing judges, and 888 points for killing uh, Morris Dees. So, you know, and I think that that reflected more or less the way other people in the white supremacist world saw Morris. Uh, you know, and at another point, there was another plot uh, which involved uh, scourging Morris. They wanted to tear the skin off his body. 
So there's a lot of hatred there. Uh, and that's, uh, of course, one of the reasons why I work in a building that is uh, just surrounded by immense security. And so what actually happened in that case? Well, what happened uh, was that he was initially charged with conspiracy, uh, uh, very serious charges in 1987 that could have sent him to prison for 20 or 30 years. Uh, but he did, in fact, cut a deal with the federal government and agree to testify in Smorth Fort Smith against his comrades. Uh, that wound up meaning a mere five-year sentence for him, and he served only three years. Uh, as you've noted, uh, the Kansas City Papers now reported that, uh, in fact, he did change his name legally. It's clear that he was in the Witness Protection Program. His, as you said, he wrote about it in his autobiography. Uh, and, you know, perhaps if he'd been in prison all those years, uh, rather than a witness in this trial, which collapsed spectacularly, uh, we wouldn't uh, have experienced what we saw in Kansas City uh, the other day. I want to go to a clip of our other guest today, David Pakman, interviewing Fraser Glenn Miller in April of 2010, when Miller was running for the U.S. Senate as a write-in candidate for Missouri. David Pakman asked Miller if he personally hated him. Do you personally dislike me? So, like, could we get along even though I'm Jewish and you hate Jews? Like, do you have anything personal against me, or how does that work? Yes. I, I, I hate all Jews. Okay. And I'll tell you why. For, for me to say out of the one corner of my mouth that I didn't hate all Jews, and then out of the other corner of my mouth say that Jews caused the deliberate murders of over 300 million of my, of my people during the 20th <laughs> century alone. Right. Okay. Of course I hate you. But what but if you what if, my hate? That's the white supremacist who's charged in the Kansas killings. Uh, talking to David Pakman, who joins us now, David, uh, you exchanged emails with Fraser Glenn Miller just months ago, that interview done in 2010. That's right. Initially, we were in touch because Craig Cobb, another white separatist who was trying to create a whites-only community in one of the Dakotas, was friends, I guess, uh, of, or, or that's at least what they would describe each other with Glenn Miller. Glenn Miller put me in touch with Cobb and uh, then was trying to insert himself back into my my program asking that I interview him when I explain that I have nothing against interviewing him in principle, but that there's really no news or there's no I, no reason to interview him right now. He kind of resorted to the same uh, anti-Jewish statements and, and rhetoric. So talk about that first interview in 2010. Yeah, the big difference—I interview a lot of extremists, uh, anti-gay extremists, religious extremists, many, many extremists. The one difference with Miller versus all the others is that the others, while their rhetoric is incredibly discriminatory and hateful against huge groups of people, they're usually very nice to me. And sometimes they say they want to save me or they want to help me in some way. And in, in their internal logic, that's what they want to do. As you saw, Miller told me very directly that he hated me, and that was an outlier. Uh, so these most re the most recent emails um, that he wanted to come on again, um, was there any indication of what he wanted to say? Well, they're, I've released these emails. They're on davidpackman.com. The full transcript is there, so people can kind of judge for themselves. If I were to uh, speculate a little bit and kind of characterize them, there was a desperation for attention, seemed to be the, the, the main priority. Uh, just really wanted attention, wanted to be on. When I said, well, why would I have you on now? He said, well, I think I'm going to run for something again soon. And I said, well, let's talk at that time. One of the emails said, as you know, your listenership, uh, including the archive, skyrocketed after having me on your show. So don't say I'm not interesting, since I'll be a candidate next year for U.S. Congress, 7th District, Missouri. You can use that as a reason to have me on. That's exactly right. And then he also uh, explained that this was kind of a running thing with him, where before the interview in 2010, he said I would never run it, because he, had, he would so badly embarrass me. Immediately after the interview, we recorded it earlier in the day before it aired, he said, you're not even going to publish that, because I so embarrassed do. Of course, we did publish it, as it's now been widely, widely disseminated. And that idea continued, that we were scared to have him on. Um, during his Senate campaign in 2010, Fraser Glenn Miller was interviewed by Howard Stern on his radio show. Uh, we call Glenn the only honest politician out there, actually. You made the good point yesterday, Robin. At least he doesn't lie. Hey, Glenn. Hey, good morning, and good morning to my friends at VNN Forum. Dot com. That's where I hang out. It's a, a discussion forum for pro-white people. I see. But anybody's invited on, Howard, I'd love to have you come over there and debate me one-on-one -on -one and let everybody decide who's right and who's wrong. 
That's Fraser Glenn Miller referring to VNN Forum or VanguardNewsNetworkForum.com. Uh, Mark Potok, can you talk about this site? Well, VNN is essentially the second largest uh, white supremacist web forum in the country, really, in the world. Uh, the largest is uh, one called Stormfront. Uh, Miller was actually banned from Stormfront, uh, which is run by former Alabama Klan leader, uh, and as I said, it's the largest, because of his informing against other leaders. Uh, but what he did essentially uh, was land on uh, VNN, uh, where he's posted close to 13,000 times in recent years. Uh, you know, what we have uh, recently uh, completed and will very shortly release a report uh, showing that, for instance, how these forums really uh, help to create killers or at least nurture killers. Uh, we found that at Stormfront, uh, over the last five years, uh, registered members of that forum have been responsible for almost 100 murders. Uh, there are also uh, many people who have become murderers who post on VNN. So these are sort of petri dishes, uh, breeding uh, grounds uh, for people like Glenn Miller. Uh, you know, VNN is a particularly uh, vicious site. Uh, they use language that you won't even find on Stormfront that's rather similar to the clips you played from Glenn Miller. Uh, it's run by a guy named Alex Linder, uh, another old-time neo-Nazi. And in fact, Linder is the guy who writes the Aryan Alternative uh, that Miller published. Um, I want to ask you about the Nevada rancher who is declaring victory after hundreds of armed supporters backed his standoff with the federal government. The Bureau of Land Management began seizing Clive and Bundy's cattle this month, saying he owed more than a million dollars in fees for grazing his cattle on federally controlled land. Bundy refused to comply, saying he doesn't recognize the federal government, and hundreds of people from right-wing, anti-government and pro-gun groups flocked to his site. Just this past weekend, they shut down Interstate 15, leading to a standoff that ended with the government backing down and releasing the seized cattle. Uh, Clive and Bundy appeared on Fox News on Monday. Listen, do you think they really have taken it over? I don't think so. Now, they might have took over our uh, Clark County Sheriff, but they never took over we the people, the sovereign people of this nation. We, we're standing. And we're going to we're going to stand until we take the guns away from those bureaucracies, and then we'll we'll, we'll start breaking America great one more time. Mark Potuck of the Southern Poverty Law Center, can you talk about Cliven Bundy and the wider significance of this standoff in Nevada? Yeah, it was an incredible moment. I mean, uh, look, the bottom line, first of all, is that Clive and Bundy is stealing from the government. He is stealing from you and me. Uh, this is a guy uh, who simply refuses to pay over a million dollar in grazing fees that every other person uh, who grazes cattle on public lands in this country must pay. So, you know, that's the context. It's hardly about defending the Constitution or anything like that. Uh, it is true that hundreds and hundreds of militiamen and others, uh, members of the very groups you referenced at the very top of the show, uh, have flocked uh, to uh, Bundy's ranch. Uh, I have seen really terrifying pictures, photographs uh, of some of these militia types uh, sitting on a uh, highway overpass with their sniper weapons trained on law enforcement officials. Uh, really, it was a terrifying situation. We had a reporter out there. Uh, it seemed obvious that at any moment uh, we could have seen gunfire and really uh, blood in the desert. Uh, you know, this is uh, the latest iteration, really, of the kinds of conflicts that we've seen peren you know, perennially over the last 15, 20 years uh, with the militia movement. The idea that somehow uh, the government has no right uh, to, uh, you know, impose any kind of law on people, particularly in the West, where there is so much resentment uh, directed at Washington. Mm. Uh, is this kind of white supremacist, far-right um, violence increasing, Mark? Well, it has been, it, it has been increasing, or at least very much uh, up, since uh, Barack Obama came into office. Uh, it was, in fact, rather quiet during the Bush years, between 2000 and 2008. 
uh, but pretty even before uh, Obama took office. As a matter of fact, immediately after he was inaugurated in the summer of 2008 in Denver, we began to see uh, plots, uh, various uh, attempts at domestic terrorism really proliferate. So the, the Glenn Miller uh, murders, or alleged murders, are not unique at all. There are a number of, uh, for instance, in June of 2009, after Obama took office, uh, I'm sure many people will remember another well-known neo-Nazi, James von Braun, shot and killed a guard at the Holocaust Museum in Washington. Uh, a couple of years after that, another neo-Nazi, again fairly well known, uh, tried to bomb a parade uh, with a very uh, powerful IED he built uh, on Martin Luther King Day in Spokane, Washington. Uh, yet a third a neo-Nazi invaded a Sikh temple in August of 2012 and murdered six people. And th these are only a few examples, but we really have seen quite a number of these. Uh, there's no question that we're seeing more violence from the domestic, non-Islamic uh, radical right than we are at this point from jihadists. And how does the government organize? I mean, number one on the domestic terrorism list, according to a top FBI official, is eco-terrorism, is the animal rights movement. We don't hear very much about white supremacists, except when something horrific like this happens. Well, let me say, the idea that eco-terrorists, so-called, uh, are the major domestic terror threat, which was, in fact, uh, said to Congress a couple of times by FBI leaders uh, during the Bush years, uh, I think is just patently ludicrous. Uh, you know, no one has been killed by anyone uh, in the radical animal rights movement or the radical uh, uh, environmentalist movement. And there are certainly groups out there that are involved in things like uh, burning down SUV dealerships and so on, but no one has been killed uh, yet. Uh, and that is in uh, just, you know, wild uh, contrast to what we're seeing uh, from people like Glenn Miller. Uh, you know, we've also seen, had a real problem with the Department of Homeland Security in the sense that ever since a particular report on the right wing was leaked to the press uh, in April of 2009, uh, DHS has sort of cowered in, in a sense. Uh, they essentially gutted their non-Islamic domestic terrorism unit uh, and really have Explain not been that. putting Just out very, very quickly, Mark. Reports. Explain that for people who do not remember what happened in 2009. Sure. The report did things like say uh, extremists are interested in recruiting returning veterans from Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, there was a hue and cry on, on the right wing, the political right wing of this country, uh, that DHS had characterized all military people, all veterans as white supremacists and extremists and so on. And that's not at all what the report said. But Janet Napolitano, then the head of DHS, withdrew the report, apologized, uh, and ultimately the unit fell apart. Uh, David Pakman, as we wrap up, uh, when you heard who was involved with the killings, who was the shooter in Kansas, your thoughts, having interviewed uh, Miller? Yeah, I heard about it in pieces. First, I heard about the shooting, and much later, it was Sunday night, I started getting tens and dozens of tweets from people saying, the, the shooter is the guy you interviewed. Of course, the interview was four years ago. It didn't immediately click. It was Kansas, where I, I associated Miller for, with Missouri. Once I figured out what this was, initially I was just shocked and then realized that this, is, this was the guy who spoke to me in one way and then took what he said, and it now became real-world violence, which, of course, was, was horrifying. And to those who say, why give him a platform? Right. Well, if I were giving him a platform in the way that corporate news gives non-science-based climate change ideas a f an equivalent platform, as if there is a 50-50 view, that would be wrong. That's not what I do. I have an opinion program. I bring these people on. It's abundantly clear that what I'm doing is exposing their views, and, and that's really why. Imagine if we had no video. We had, you know, off often we have these crimes, and then people say, we never heard anything. There's nothing. We don't know who this person is. Now we know. Thank you.